Okay, thank you. So, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to, thanks for coming, right? Uh, welcome to the first session of the sustainability track, our day two. And uh, for the audience online who are watching when we play, a big welcome to you also. Uh, we want to thank the planning committee actually in enabling us to be a first session of the day because uh, I always find that being the first session uh, it guarantees what we're talking about will be original. So we actually are the first to tell you about the introduction to sustainability and the different concepts. But do stay for the rest of the sessions because I saw the agenda and everybody else is equally exciting. So where does 1.5 degrees C centigrade come from, right? So I think that's a question everybody talks about when you're coming in here. At the UN Climate Change uh, Paris meeting in 2015, uh, there were 196 participants, and they actually got together and discussed about climate change. And they signed a treaty on climate change, discussing about what we need to do. And the treaty agreed upon that we want to basically right, limit global warming to be 1.5 degrees C for, compared to pre-industrial times. So that's the key thing about 1.5 degrees C. And also collectively is that it's been decided that if we do not limit and work together to reduce the climate, the temperature to be 1.5 degrees C, as you can see is that we can see that was that a heat waves may actually result because of global warming which actually then cause, as we can see, the Arctic ice thaws and ocean that actually will rise and droughts and floods that can occur. Okay, so the key thing I want to bring out to all of us is because, I'm sorry, I can't see my slides. So, so that the thing is, uh, so that species loss will happen and that's what the whole climate change is about, right? Everybody's discussing about how we want to get together so that we actually can mitigate the, uh, the, what's this scenario happening. So I mentioned earlier, uh, what is 1.5 degrees C compared to? It is compared to the pre-industrial times, at, which is the global temperature change relative in 19, 1850 to 1900. So the key thing I want everybody to remember is that we're comparing against a relative time of increase. That's why it's 1.5 degrees C and not another number. So what does 1.5 degrees C mean? I think that's a question we all have, right? For the first, so you say 50 to 100 years, I think about it is that we had a rise comparably of 0.25 degrees C. That's what happened in 1960. That was a measurement in 1960. If we actually take another step forward, right? I think about the next uh, almost approximately 60 years, we rose to one degree C. So that was at, you look at it in 2017, that was a relative, to, which is a 4X increase, if you think about what's happening. And the next step where you can see uh, things are expectation. Right? Our expectation is that by 2040, we will reach 1.5 degrees C. And this is actually a very, very important number because as we do all understand, right, when we reach that, as the previous page actually showed, it will cause a lot of significant harm and potentially, right, I think it's changed to our ways of living and things that will happen. So as we're here today, I think it's important to understand why we're talking about this because if you think about it, if we do nothing, this line, as old chart says, will go to the right and up. So we must all take actions together, and that's what we're here today to discuss. And the many sessions, I think later you'll hear, is, uh, there are different ways of methods of achieving that, but we need to collectively work together to do that. So now we're all engineers, or at least in engineering and working with engineers. Engineers love formulas and equations, as we don't know very well. So we need to have a shall we say, a metric and a way to achieve what we want to do. Greenhouse gas is a way that everybody talks about measuring. Measuring about how we can achieve reduction in carbon and reduction in achieving our 1.5 degrees C. So greenhouse gas, as we all know, is a gas basically which, that we call about gases that actually was it captures heat, right? And actually prevents heat from actually escaping from the earth. So, in addition to greenhouse gas, as we talk about measuring this, the most important thing is for us as a corporations and all of us working together is the greenhouse gas protocol has defined three different scopes. I think many of you have seen before, there's scope one, scope two, and scope three. Why do we define scopes? Because only by defining scopes do we have targets and actionable items to work on. 
So I know there are many of you probably already know this one. You think about the things that direct emissions for what you do as a company. Scope two and three are indirect emissions. Scope two is actually indirect emissions based on the energy that we actually use to, uh, which is, uh, we actually consume. So simply, the most exam simple example is electricity. pg and here, you know, who Bay Area we're actually using, is uh, scope two, and how much of that are we using, which actually is clean, and then how we actually do it. For example, right, if you're using wind versus fossil fuel, right, that's a type of scope two measurement and how we actually are accounting for that, greenhouse gas. And lastly, I think it's the hardest one for all of us is scope three. Scope three is the mission by our suppliers and by our customers. These are, these are should we say, metrics that we cannot control, but what we can control is here at OCP Summit with our brilliant minds here, the equipment we build, the process we do, how we ask our suppliers and how we actually give equipment to our customers. We want to think of ways in order to actually reduce their emission by building better project, products, more efficient product, right? Less energy consuming. That's the whole goal. And last thing I think on this slide is just to show you, again, very much as engineers. What is important to all of us engineers is actually the unit. The unit for greenhouse gas measurement is carbon to CO2E equivalent. Obviously, there's carbon dioxide, but we have to think of how to calculate the equivalency. And for those who are interested in understanding how to calculate many equivalencies, if you look at the epa.gov, uh, there are actually are calculators there that are very, very good calculators. So now we know about greenhouse gas, we know about the measurements of engineers. How do we achieve the path to net zero? I think that's what we ask ourselves. Very simple. Should we say there has to be a plan? And greenhouse gas emission is fairly simple. Let's hypothetically look at us today. If we are a certain number today, how do we do our journey, take our journey to 2040 so that we're actually net zero? It has to be a process. I think as we do when we are design, there's a schedule, there's a time. How we actually gradually, we cannot do it in one day. So every day you wait, you actually it's gonna impact and it's gonna be harder. The earlier you do it, the fast, the more possible it is achieved by 2040. But also, I think if you can see this chart, this is very clear to all of us. The clarity is what? We will always emit carbon. There's no way for any of us to do zero by ourselves. We must partner or work with others, right? Because as engineers, divide and conquer is actually the best way to achieve what we need to do. So there will be additional carbon reduction, which we had to work with other people, that actually help us, because we're going to reach an equilibrium and constant state that we can drop no further. Similarly, I think our path to net zero, we all know. If we do nothing, nothing, you know what happens, right? Same thing I'm going to say again. To the right and up, business as usual. So I would like to make sure that we all think about deeply how we handle ourselves, how we are responsible for ourselves every day. Net zero by 2040. So I think uh, we talk about this and we're focusing on this. At Cisco, uh, we take net zero very responsibly and we actually think about this in deep ways. So that's why we're here talking about it. If you look at our ESG report and our ESG hub, we have a lot of initiatives. But OCP is a hardware summit and we talk about the hardware and the software integration. So we want to share with you our method, right? And I think we're talking about 100 rules we have today. It can change tomorrow because we continually evolved. But rather than boring all of you with the 100 rules, I think what the topic of the subject today is, we summarize it into six categories. And six categories of how we actually have summarized and the work we have done in our hardware team with our engineering team to actually achieve and work toward Net Zero 2040. And very simply, I think how we ask if the 100 you're probably thinking, there actually was a different, every single category has a different amount right now, and that's how we move forward. So now I'm going to pass it to my co-presenter, Waylon, and he's going to walk us through some example and illustrate how we actually can achieve net zero with how it's these categories. So Waylon. Let's start with the uh, a familiar topic, uh, bill of substance. Every substance has a unique and, and ambiguous chemical abstract service registry number. We show an example on the screen. 
the set of materials represents a heat sink, which we are familiar with. For our path to net zero, we can start by asking all of our suppliers to provide full material disclosure with the bill of substance so that we can derive the product carbon footprint. With this disclosure, that includes weight, recycle content, CO2 equivalent emissions can be derived. With this metric, we can adjust our path to carbon reduction. With clarity on CO2 emissions contributions from material use, let's investigate another opportunity to our net zero path. Compute servers are well known for flexibility and serviceability. This applies to storage drives, power supplies, compute and network cards, memory DIMMs, and socket CPUs. Modular hardware extends the reliability, availability, and serviceability of the product. The longer we can keep our hardware in action for repair and upgrades, the quicker we can achieve our path to net zero. For product packaging, clearly our products must travel distances across the globe to reach the end users. For production starts across the continents in Asia, Europe, or Americas, for example, and deployment is everywhere in the world, land, air, or sea, and even in our space. Secure transport requires strong uh, product packaging. We all know that styrofoam is non-biodegradable, bulky, and difficult to recycle. But styrofoam has been our industry go-to packaging strategy because of its robustness to handle different G-forces, as shown by the cushion curve. We can see that the traditional styrofoam can withstand 1.5 pounds per square inch at 60 Jeez. The good news is that our path to net zero is possible with thermofoam plastic, which is recyclable and reusable, meeting the cushion curve G-force at equivalent PCI, PSI. So today we advocate the use of uh, make, use, and recycle. Uh, this is clearly uh, our uh, uh, a part of our uh, circular economy strategy. We can see that uh, this is uh, applied with our telepresence units, uh, glass and plastic, but we must do more. Here we show additional circularity, and the additional circularity is we can do this with two loops, an, an outer loop, which is we've already des des described as make, use, and recycle, and in addition, an inner loop. The, the inner loop is use, more use, and reuse. This additional inner loop is something that we can take advantage of. Um, during the pandemic, we have, for example, uh, deployed our telepresence units across, uh, redeployed our telepresence units from our Cisco offices uh, to hospitals uh, throughout the world. You can't, you can't manage what you can't measure. So let's build hardware with telemetry that can provide smart energy dashboards. The smart energy dashboards that display energy consumption, carbon intensity, GHG emissions, energy cost, and energy mix. Our phones today display battery usage by application. We can influence ourselves to decide which applications to cut down the usage. Smart energy data allows us to fine tune and adjust behaviors and energy hogs. Let me hand back to Chizong to talk about innovation. Okay, so uh, in closing, I think uh, we have a Two more, three more slides. I want to really capture the thoughts right now, right? Uh, innovation, I think, is probably the bloodline of what we do today as companies. Uh, I want to give an example of how innovation could actually continue onward. So remember the styrofoam product packaging? It's a fairly boring topic maybe to all of us because, you know, you get a package, just probably look at it for less than one minute, you throw away, right? But there's a lot of innovation behind that. Styrofoam is not recyclable, and it's a really actually detrimental thing, but it's a great, great material. 
We move on to thermoform. I think we see that it's very clearly. It is recyclable and made of a recycled material, but not as good as we can actually do. So we just want to share with you, I think, as you look at, there's a lot more innovations going on. There's innovation in mold pulp. If you think about your carton, right, milk carton, as an example, honeycomb, paper tubing, and fiber tube. So we just want to illustrate to you that thing is that we don't stop innovating. We shouldn't stop once we have a solution. Let's keep on moving forward. Innovation is in our bloodline, and that's what this OCP is about, and that's why we want to think about this. Sustainability is a journey and not a destination. I always like to tell people this because I think that's a reality. We, don't, we keep on going. I usually like to make my decisions myself using a two by two, and I wanted to use, apply a sustainability to this two by two. This two by two is very simple in my own decision making process. Basically, you know, there are activities that are wrong to do, there are activities that are right to do. There are things that are right to, uh, should we say, uh, right to do and things are wrong to do. So very simply, I think is, uh, I, I see the timer is, uh, so, yeah, the click is that. So first thing, uh, let's cover what we think is right or that's wrong or wrong. So plastic, I think we all think about plastics, right? Plastic is something we think is recyclable, it's awesome, right? But you really look at, there are actually seven levels of recyclability on plastic. It's not that easy to recycle plastic. If I look at what I get, I actually don't know which dumpster to put it in. So it's a great thing to do, but you know, I think it's the wrong thing, a wrong thing. I want to talk about something that's wrong and actually potentially done right. Carbon offset. Remember, I said we're going to get reaching net zero, we're going to be flat line. I need help from somebody else, divide and conquer. Conservation is another topic, I think that's interesting. It's the right thing to do, I think everybody wants to do it, but oftentimes I think we do it wrong. Uh, why do I say we do it wrong? There's a social, equitable, and responsible way of doing it. In the domain, not such a great way of doing it, right? Lastly, let's practice abstinence. I think that's the best thing to do. Why is abstinence so important? Because that's the simplest way, right? It's a virtue. Don't consume and waste what you need to do. So, in summary, a goal without plan is just a wish. That is reality. The call to action is very simple. 1.5 degrees C. That's what this whole message is about today. We have a formula, we have an equation, we have a method. At Cisco, we have 100 rules today. I want you to think about yours, take out the numbers, make up, come up with your own rules and talk to us about it. So I wanna thank everybody for coming today and I think my time is up. So please, I think there are amazing sessions I see the rest of the day I'll be sitting through and I hope you invite your friends to come through because I think this is a very, very important thing that we have to do together. Thank you.